you may notice uh, that I have stolen this quote as the uh, headline of my presentation from a piece of commentary given in 2010 uh, by Andy Gray. And I think most of us would see this as a somewhat of a, somewhat, in somewhat of a uh, flippant way. Of course, Messi would be fantastic even playing on a cold, rainy night in Stoke because he's one of the best players in the world. But I think it is a more interesting question than you'd first think. Of course, context matters, not just in that the physics of playing football are fundamentally different in a cold, wet stadium than they are in a warm, dry one. The, the ball moves along the pitch in a different way. But also because he's then, because at Barcelona, he's in a situation where he's grown up with this team. They would know where he is with their eyes closed. They could pass the ball anywhere on the pitch and the person they expected to be there would be there. So, hello, I'm Ollie. I'm an electrical engineering student at the University of Lincoln. Uh, for my sins, I'm a Nottingham Forest supporter. Uh, they are now finally in the Premier League. Uh, you know, th this, they have not been, until obviously this season and last, since before I was born. And I'm a big fan of unsolvable problems, like football. Valuing players is a very difficult task. Part of that is that we only see a little bit of it. You know, if we're looking at event data, we only see what happens with the ball. Even if we have full tracking data, we're still only seeing the image a few times a second. It's also very hard to measure what good events and bad events are because there are, you know, games are decided by score. There are some you know, two, three, maybe goals on the average game. But there are thousands of actions, possibly. And it's also not particularly clear how a given action is necessarily connected to a good or a bad outcome. I'm sure many of you will have seen the absolute snooze fest of Arsenal versus Man City recently, of you know, 75 minutes of passing the ball between the centre-backs. And that is part of what makes it very difficult to measure how good some players are. Centre-backs, defensive midfielders, there's a big challenge on measuring the impact they have on the games beyond just counting you know, some of the stuff we decided is good. You know, is it better to have a defensive midfielder who's like Rodri, who generally just gets in the way and does you know, nice, simple passes to keep everything ticking? Or do you want somebody like Perlo who will just absolutely run the game basically staying in the same position the whole time. It's also been particularly challenging to divide up some of these specific uh, valuation points. It's very hard to figure out what makes good defensive work. Um, it, you know, how much of it is, so much of it is positioning that we can't necessarily know, even with significantly detailed tracking data. And it's very hard then to also divide the blame of you know, something negative happening between all the different players on the pitch. It may very well be three or four different players' fault. How do you divide that in any reasonable way? The other issue is obviously off-ball off movement. You know, even with tracking data, how do you measure the difference that a player being there makes on the, on the defensive uh, structure? They may, if they'd have moved in a slightly different way, it may have made no difference whatsoever, given that the defence may very well have reacted in a way that would counteract that. So instead of trying to hack together a model with you know, dozens of assumptions, why not just keep it basic? Why not just try and figure out basically what we're doing with the next action? So the idea, I mean, this is a reasonably, reasonable simplification, is that we're trying to figure out um, based on the lineups of each team, uh, which you see on the left-hand side here, uh, and the game state, we're doing some, uh, we're learning represent the model's learning representations, which are inspired by something called variational autoencoders, which basically tries to plot um, a shape in five dimensions, in this case, um, that represents the whole lineup uh, in, a, in a more simple way. We add those all together, and then we try and predict what action will happen next and where the ball will end up for each of those different possible actions. And then also, if it's a shot, how good the quality of that shot is. Um, you may notice that this is a very simple version of a game. There are no set pieces. 
It is only passes, carries, and shots. We don't even know the player on the ball. There's no fouls. Remarkable little, remarkably little data for a model to guess, basically, how good at football a given team is. But it does pretty well. Compared, to, I mean, uh, see at the bottom here, compared to 538 on a match level, it's fairly solid. Um, just to briefly explain the Bryce skill saw, zero is basically where you would predict a game as if the home team had the same chance of winning based on how many games the home team usually won over seasons. Um, and compared to that, it's it pretty good, um, even though it knows very little about what's going on. You will see there are some possibly quite interesting results on there. Um, Man United and Burnley specifically, quite uh, specifically, quite significantly outperform uh, the simulated results. And um, I have got some thoughts as to why that is, but we can go on to that in the next slide. Um, but yeah, as you can see, it's pretty good at actually guessing which teams are good. Um, Man, Man City did absolutely fantastically getting anywhere near 100 points, I'm sure. That will not be reached again soon. But we can also look a bit deeper at the um, various statistics. You'll see this shows the um, correlation between uh, the average simulation, so all of them added together, and the actual um, statistics from the season, which is 2017, 2018. It's pretty good at guessing most of them. Um, it's pretty terrible at figuring out the quality of shots that teams concede. And that's why I think it struggles quite so much with Burnley and Man United. Obviously, at the time, they were coached by Sean Dyche and Jose Mourinho, both managers who are very good at constructing you know, solid defensive blocks that reduce the quality of the chances they concede. And I think the model does have difficulty picking that out. And that is probably why they, over, they overperformed compared to what my simulation expect is. I'm, I'm, I haven't asked if I can do this, but we are going to do a bit of audience participation. Um, so I've, done, I've, I've looked at the differences that six managers make if we swap them with Pep Guardiola in the 2017-2018 season with all of the given lineups. Uh, I think there are six. Uh, Arsene Wenger, uh, Antonio Conte, Jose Mourinho, <coughs> Pochettino, Sean Dyche, and possibly another one I'm forgetting but I'm going to go through them all briefly. If you could stick your hands up, if you think they're going to do the best with Man City, I would appreciate it. So we'll start with Arsene Wenger. All right. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, that's the other one I forgot. There we go. Let's do him next. Okay, Pochettino. Conte. Jose Mourinho, and Sean Dyche. Well, uh, remarkably even, actually, I would say, between the three different options. They, you may find this surprising, you may not. Um, based on what the model suggests, Klopp and Wenger do pretty similarly with the Man City squad at that time, uh, followed by Pochettino, and then followed by Mourinho and Conte, and then quite far behind that, Sean Dyche. It is quite interesting that this model is not actually only picking up quality. You know, there is a pretty clear stylistic correlation between teams that tend to play similarly, you know, or with, with their squads doing better with teams that suit them. Mourinho, you know, possibly does not suit the uh, Man City team at that time particularly well. Uh, and, and just for interest, you can also see the difference that Pep makes to the team of the manager he's been swapped with. Uh, him, obviously, struggling particularly with Burnley, but doing very well with Chelsea. Uh, the other thing, one, obviously, the most interesting thing we could do with this is have a look at what differences players make. Uh, you can see here, probably quite a big swap, um, but just swapping uh, Harry Kane and Rondon, um, basically losing Kane loses... Um, Tottenham basically all chance of winning the Premier League in that season whatsoever. And we can also have a look at the difference in prize money because it can figure out where exactly where in the, in the league each 
uh, team finished in the simulations and the difference between them. So you can see it costs uh, Tottenham quite a lot of money to lose Kane over the year um, in, in just prize money, but obviously also in terms of commercial other impacts. Um, and you'll see that West Brom did get better, but not as they did not get as much better as Tottenham got worse. So clearly the uh, initial statement of asking could you do it in Stoke is, 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 an, is a actually fairly present one. We can also show that it doesn't work for you know, the harder to value positions. Fernandinho obviously, quite, obviously contributes quite a lot of value to the Man City team at that time. It does significantly harm their chances of you know, winning the Premier League. They go from the favorite to, I believe, the second favorite um, behind Arsenal, I think. Uh, and then also you can see that he does actually make quite a lot of difference to Stoke's um, monetary situation, even if he doesn't improve their chances of staying up very much. The, I did look at some other ones, um, ones that actually happened. So I had an investigator of the um, sanchez Mkhitaryan um, swap between Manchester United and Arsenal, and that would have made a difference if it hadn't happened. Uh, interestingly, it thought both teams were worse off with the transfer having happened, which you, know, you may or may not disagree with. Um, I think it's probably more to do with um, issues with the, with the model necessarily rather than with that actually being the case. This you may be quite hard to read from a distance, but uh, so the idea is that a score of one means the teams are essentially identical in terms of their approach. Uh, this is the representations that the models learnt in the process uh, of its predictions, and the score of zero is they're the most different of any two teams that are picked. So the more red it is, the more distinct they are from the rest of the league, and the more green it is, the more similar they are. Um, you'll see that obviously, sort of, Man City are in somewhat of a league of their own in terms of style compared to, particularly on the um, defensive side. Uh, but it you know, does seem to pick up the, quality, the actual approach reasonably well. West Brom, I, uh, at that time, I believe managed by Tony Pulis, I think, um, were obviously you know, massively different defensively to how Man City approached the game, and, and that's to be expected. So how do we do? Well. It does have some rough edges that need to be smoothed out, but generally it works quite well. Um, it's clearly learning different styles in both manager and sort of team styles overall. It can distinguish the impact of player transfers to a reasonable extent better at some than others, and it's you know, better when it's clearer, uh, and hopefully you know, with some improvement um, on that front will be forthcoming. Um, and it's also a great starting point, I think, for future work, because the more assumptions we build into our models, the more, the less statistically, well, the less statistically uh, rigorous they're becoming, and we get more and more problems from that. Uh, we do need to do it, I do need to see if we can fix the defensive problems, um, and also see if we can figure out whether the sanchez Mkhitaryan deal was actually good or not, as, as, as part of that, I suppose. And it would also be interesting to add more features to the simulation, such as um, doing sin, uh, injuries and suspensions, and whether if a player is more liable to injuries or getting suspended, how much of a difference that makes to your season, so that you can actually appropriately value the expected change in, you know, they will make to your team over the whole season. And yes, I will... So thank you. Uh, thank you to Duncan and um, Scott who've been helping me with our, my project. And yeah, I'll happily answer any questions. I really enjoy that. Thank you, Ali. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to ask what uh, data inputs of a, of a player uh, affected the, their style? Um, yeah, so um, Basically, it doesn't actually take anything more from the player other than the fact that they're on the pitch at the time the action happens. Um, the idea is that actually we could probably infer quite a lot about their impact on actions on the pitch um, just by the fact that they are, what well, actions happen while they're there. Um, you know, whether it's a player that makes a specific run, you know, perhaps down the, down the wing to make a specific run every time and therefore allows that option of a pass there more often it should be able to pick up those differences, even though it doesn't actually know anything other than the fact that they're there and what happens when they're there, even if they're not the one touching the ball. Uh, what's your sort of intuition or hunch around the, like, the difference in the performance like, for the defensive side of things? Um, yeah, so I think 
I've got, I've got a couple of thoughts. I think one of it may be a little bit more technical in that um, it's not quite learning the right representation, which might be too big, and it might not being able to figure it out uh, because it's got you know, too much math to do almost. Um, but I think it's possibly also that it just hasn't had long enough training because it's quite a rare event to figure out in the first place. It might just not have not had enough training to you know, learn the difference between, say, you know, a Man United and a Man City in terms of how they defend and what kind of chances they concede. What's the size of your data set versus uh, the number of parameters of your neural network? Uh, so the data set was, so it's two, essentially three quarter seasons and one full season that are consecutive. So 2015, 16, seven, 16 17, 17, 18. Um, and I believe the, it's got something like 1.5 million events in it um, that I'm using. And it's got uh, 20,000 parameters or something, I'd say. Maybe less than that. Um, just off the top of my head, I, I could give you a better answer with access to my laptop, but I, I can't right now. Sorry. Fabulous. Can we thank Ollie again? Yeah.